Dave Bittman is a constable for the Edmonton Police Service. On a Sunday morning, he and his partner roll to Rundle Park Village, where a six-year-old named Corrine Punky Gustafson has gone missing. My first thoughts were, come on now, it's a quiet morning. Uh, perhaps this little girl went to the local convenience store with another friend and maybe there's trouble at home and she didn't want to go home right away. I went up to the front door and knocked on the door and there I met Ray Gustafson. Gustafson tells Bittman Corrine was outside playing with her friend Lindsay, who reported that a man had taken Corrine. Between her mother coming home with the look of sheer terror on her face and the information that we'd gleaned thus far, I had thought in my own mind at that time that uh, this was a bona fide abduction. To get a better handle on what he's dealing with, Bettman walks to the back of the house where the girls were playing. This suspect walks up, comes right up to them, and essentially just grabs onto Corinne takes her in his arms, and then turns 180 degrees and heads directly back towards that walkway. Lindsay is unable to provide a clear description of the abductor, but Bittman gets what information he can out of the five-year-old. We come around the corner and, and ask our witness, point directly the route that this fellow took. Point to us, tell us, show us. And she walks us again through this little walkway between the units, 147 and 148. About 50 feet down the walkway, Bittman see. notices a dampened patch of mud and a footprint. The most prominent footwear impression that was inlaid in this mud appeared to be that of a sports shoe, like somebody playing soccer or baseball would wear, like a cleat. You know, Bittman takes a sketch of the impression, and a door-to-door -door search of the neighborhood begins. Two days after Corrine Gustafson disappeared, detectives Terry Alm and Al Sove arrive at a trucking yard just outside Edmonton's city limits. The body of a six-year-old girl lies in the mud near the back of the lot. It is not immediately apparent to the detectives how Corrine Gustafson died. It does appear, however, that she was killed somewhere else and then dumped among the flatbeds. She had been redressed. The way in which her her panties were on, the way in which her pants were on, the way the which her coat was put on, all led us to believe that she was killed and raped somewhere else. Not far from the body, investigators noticed tire tracks and cleat marks similar to those found at the Gustafson home. An autopsy establishes that Corrine was most likely smothered to death. The ME also discovers a single pubic hair on the victim's left ankle. But it was such a small piece that the DNA uh, technology at the time didn't lend itself to developing a profile from that. So the hope was that as DNA technology advanced, that we'd eventually get a profile from the partial root bulb on that pubic hair. By January of 2000, Terry Alm has been working the Gustafson case for more than seven years, nearly the last four by himself. So we decided to uh, have all of Corrine's clothing and the swabs re-examined. Alm hopes new technology will be able to identify and develop a usable DNA profile in the case. He sends items of evidence to a private lab in North Carolina. One year later, Alm gets a call. The unknown profile is uploaded into Canada's National DNA Data Bank and hits to a man named Clifford Slay, a convicted sex offender, and a name Terry Alm is familiar with. Clifford Slay had come to our attention in May of 93 when he had sexually assaulted a young teenage girl. And he was investigated at the time. Um, his family had uh, alibied him, and he was sort of put on the back burner. Slay was one of thousands of suspects looked at during the 10-year Gustafson investigation. Now he takes center stage and is asked to explain why his semen was found on the clothes of a six-year-old. We're not here to pass judgment on you. We're only here to deal with the truth. 
we knew from our background research that once Clifford was put into or painted into a corner where he thought uh, the gig was up and, and the, the deck was stacked against him, that, that he would tell the truth. Slay is informed that DNA testing has matched his genetic profile to semen found on the victim's clothes. The next day, the suspect decides he wants to talk. He is cold and calculated. He, uh, he, it's almost a matter of fact. At that point, with us, there are no tears, there, there is no emotion. I look at what I've done, and there is no light in the tunnel. I just don't I'm really prepared for what's going to happen, but you know, I've done a lot of thinking. I've come to terms with this is something I have to own up to. Slay tells Godfrey that in September of 1992, he was having marital problems with his common-law wife. It was a combination of a lot of things going on. Um, I started drinking. Um, I was with my common-law wife then. Got into a bit of a fight. And he wanted to punish her. And uh, potentially he wanted to uh, locate her daughter and assault her. Slay could not locate his wife's daughter. Instead, he left the apartment and got into his brother-in-law's car. I had plans of just going down to the, the Mohawk station, just for a He went out, and it would appear he went out on the prowl or on the hunt. I was so very angry. You know, uh, I was pretty drunk. I was actually going to turn around. I turned into these apartment uh, townhouses. Slay says he pulled into Rundle Park Village and noticed six-year-old Corrine Gustafson playing with her friend. I see uh, these two little girls playing in this uh, fence area. Mm -hmm. I made up my mind that I was going to grab one. And it just happened to be uh, the one closest to the fence. And he tucked her under his arm and uh, put her in his vehicle and, and took off. I'd taken, you know, this little girl to, I don't know, to, there was just this road that I followed. Uh, as I drove down this road, I mean, thoughts were there, but I didn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of drive as far as I could on this road, drop off and just leave. But when I realized that there was no traffic in this area, it's very secluded, you know, I just, Slay says he raped Corrine for some 10 minutes. When he finished, Slay claims Corrine was still alive and that he let her go. I took her out of the car, I took her and I put her on the back end of this, this uh, part of the trailer. The fenders would be covered the tires. I, I sat around there. We know how she was found. That's, that was that's very clear how she was found, and uh, that was not that's not true. Slay fails to take responsibility for Corrine's murder. Godfrey believes it to be a calculated move. I think he tried to minimize his involvement. I think he knew the difference between first degree murder and second degree murder and potentially manslaughter. Uh, so that his explanation was, was made to try and fit something less than a first-degree murder conviction. Slay is arrested and booked on a charge of murder. Jason Track is the Crown Prosecutor for Alberta and responsible for trying Clifford Slay for first-degree murder. He made the admission of abducting this child. He also made the admission of sexually assaulting her. We looked at all of the evidence, and we believe that to a degree of 100% certainty, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but to 100% certainty, she was dead when he left her. As part of his case, Track plays Slay's confession in open court. I guess I, I raped her, you know, but I, I didn't kill her. I, I was very surprised when I, when I heard that she had died. 
it was putrid to listen to the tape of his confession and to hear this stuff coming from his mouth and trying to downplay uh, his culpability in this crime. The tape plays exactly as the prosecution had intended. Slay's words appearing to be both callous and calculating. If he was capable of empathy and a remorse, he never would have committed such a crime, but he's such a botched human being that he was able to do such an act. The jury deliberates for one day and returns the verdict track requested. Slay is found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to life in prison. Under Canadian law, however, he will be eligible to apply for parole in 25 years.